area here at the garden tomb and not far away from here is the mountain called Golgotha where many believe that Jesus was crucified on 2000 years ago. Here in this garden we commemorate the culmination of everything that we think and pray about during this Passover week. But did you know that when the Jewish people is celebrating Passover every year, that on the eve of Passover, the meal, the traditional Passover Seder meal, there are so many parallels that are pointing to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Today we are going to have a very special look on those connections and also we will look at the crucifixion of Jesus. We look at some of the, his, of the historical backgrounds and I believe you will be surprised and blessed to see the impact of this event that took place here in this very place 2000 years ago. Please join me. Here in Jerusalem, just outside the old city walls, you can find a beautiful and vibrant garden. And right beside the garden, a rock face known as Skull Hill, or Golgotha. Welcome to the garden tomb. Scripture tells us that in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb. It was into that tomb that the body of Jesus was laid. Millions of people around the world believe that this garden is that place. What makes a visit to the garden tomb unique is the connection between Skull Hill, the garden, and the tomb itself. These three elements work together to bring to life that final chapter of Jesus' ministry. Early on the third day after the burial of Jesus, some women came to the tomb seeking his body. An angel appeared to them and said, I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he is risen. This is a tomb an empty tomb that speaks of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For many people, this is a life-changing moment. After a visit to the tomb, there is time and space for people to reflect upon the story of Jesus the Messiah, his death and resurrection. Many groups decide to book a place where they can meet for worship and prayer, maybe communion. As well as tours of the garden, we also host events such as worship services for large Christian groups and also musical concerts. Every day, groups and individuals from all over the world are blessed and encouraged by their visit to the garden tomb. Entrance is free and we're supported by the donations of our visitors and also by the garden tomb shop. Wherever you are and wherever you come from, I encourage you to come and visit the garden tomb. Come and see for yourself. We look forward to welcoming you soon. Every spring, Jewish families gather to celebrate the faithfulness of God and to remember the miraculous deliverance from the bondage of Egypt through a ceremonial meal known as the Passover Seder. In this video, Dr. Jürgen Bühler shares an added dimension of celebration for not only Jewish people, but also for us as believers in Yeshua, the Messiah. Welcome everybody to the Bühler House for this Passover celebration. It's a great joy to have you all with us. Well, let me explain to you the, the meaning of uh, the Passover table. You have a similar table today in almost every home here in Israel. The main components are the bitter herbs, which are representing the bitterness of the experience in Egypt and slavery. And along with that is the, the bowl of salted water representing the generations of tears of uh, slavery and bondage. Uh, you have here the bone, which in most places is a chicken bone, but it does represent the Passover lamb. And the only sweet part on the Passover table is the charoset. This is this brown paste of date honey and nuts and it does represent uh, the only help the Jewish people received which was the mortar they could use in order to put the bricks together. 
And of course, most importantly, you have the matzah bread and you have wine at every Passover celebration. You are going to have four cups of wine. The tradition goes back to Exodus chapter 6. The Lord says, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from Egypt. That's the first cup. The next one, he says, I will deliver you from slavery. And the third cup says, I'm going to redeem you as a people. And the fourth cup is uh, from Exodus 6 verse 7. He says, and I will take you to be my people. In Luke chapter 22, we read in verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. In verse 14, And when the hour has come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, what is important for us today to understand is that this ancient tradition was also kept by Jesus and by his disciples. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. And if you read the same story in the First Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, The Lord revealed it to me that at the night when he was betrayed, he took the cup after the meal. That means both Paul and the Gospels, they say, well, what's coming now, that was taking place after the Passover meal. And he took the bread, and what is happening at every Passover celebration, uh, this wrapped piece of bread, which is called for the Jewish people, the afikoman, is being opened and being eaten and blessed. And as they celebrate it, they commemorate, again, like we said, the pierced and the striked, body of our Lord that was broken for us. And the Bible tells us in Matthew 26 that when he blessed it and he said something like the following, he says, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamutzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed are thou, Lord of the universe, who brought forth the bread from the earth. He broke it and at that point he broke the tradition of the Passover Seder. And he said, take and eat it. This is my body. He then took after the meal the cup, and this was the third cup in the Passover meal. And then he blessed it, and he probably said something like this, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagaven, blessed are thou, Lord of the universe, who brought forth the wine from the earth. And as he was handing it over to his disciples, he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. And what Jesus was telling his disciples, he said, I'm the Passover lamb. Amen. I'm the one who is shedding my blood for you and giving my, my body for your atonement. So I believe this was an unforgettable Passover evening for the Jewish people. And for us as believers, it's important that we are reminded that communion is not a new Christian tradition that the Roman Catholic Church or any denomination started, but it was a part of a regular Passover meal. Whenever we celebrate communion, we actually are re-celebrating one segment of every Passover meal that the Jewish people are celebrating in a way that Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of that. In the book of Matthew, um, verse, chapter 26, verse 30, he says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And usually you overread that. But at the end of a Passover, there is a passage that is called the Hallel. And the Hallel is uh, a selection of Psalms. It is Psalm 115 to 118. And those Psalms are read at every year's Passover celebration. So when Jesus was uh, installing and instating the communion with his disciples, he didn't stop there and says, okay, now we are on the new covenant, but he actually continued with the Seder, with the same tradition, like all the people in Israel. They were singing the Hallel, the same Psalms that the Jewish people are singing today all over the world. And my favorite Psalm there is Psalm 118. And in Psalm 118, you have the very famous passage, it says, the stone that the builders rejected, he has become the main cornerstones. And of course, we know about whom that speaks. It speaks about Yeshua. The other favorite uh, passage is uh, the next verse, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or in Hebrew, it says, Baruch Shenem Adonai. And I believe we all know where Jesus said that it was just a few days earlier before Passover. He was standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem and he says, you won't see me again until you say, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Abba means welcome. That's how you welcome people into your house. Jesus says, I will not come back until you welcome me back to that city. And I would say, let's just say this prayer together and uh, let's pray this to the Lord that he might come quickly. Let's pray, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. And at the very end of the Passover Seder, um, probably the most famous passage in the entire Seder is recited. It says, Le Shana Haba B'Yerushalayim. And this little sentence kept alive for thousands of years the yearning and the dream of the Jewish people, one day we come back to our homeland. And what a powerful statement that is to finish a Passover Seder, a prophetic statement that one day the Jewish people will come back to this land, will be fully restored. And with this, I wish you all a happy Passover. I'm reading from John 19, verse 16 to 18 where it says, so he delivered them over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. We are here at the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem, a place where every year hundreds of thousands of people come from around the world to commemorate the most important act that took place in this very city, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Through it, millions of people from every tribe and nation came into a living relationship with the God in heaven. It was a rock not far away from here that resembles the shape of a skull that made General Gordon believe some 100 years ago that he found the true place of Golgotha. And also his belief was underlined when he found a, a tomb enclosed with a garden not far away. That's why it's called the garden tomb. When we think and contemplate today about the crucifixion of Jesus, we are forced to look into the very abyss of the human heart. Crucifixion was the most cruel way of executing people in antiquity. According to historians, this cruel form of death penalty was invented in the ancient city of Carthago. Now Carthago was captured by the Romans and it was completely destroyed that only a field of ruin remains until today. But they took one thing from that city and this was the art of crucifixion. The inventor of it must have been a completely perverted human being that even the Roman people when it was applied in the empire were completely appalled by this punishment. One of the great politicians and thinkers of Rome, Seneca, called it the most cruel and disgusting punishment. To die on the cross could take even several days. The condemned would not die of the wounds inflicted on him, but the weight of his own body was hanging on the nails through his hands and through his feet. And the condemned had to lift himself up against those nails when he took a breath so that means at the end the strength left him completely and he would at the end slowly suffocate or even die of cardiac arrest. The Roman politician Seneca therefore, he decreed that it was completely unacceptable to apply this death penalty to a Roman citizen. He said there is no crime large enough that would justify to kill a Roman citizen in such a brutal way. To crucify the Son of God seems like a contradiction in itself. It seems like the most foolish thought to contain the one who was from the beginning, who was the Alpha and Omega, the Lord, the Logos, the world that was there when the world was created, the one who has all powers in heaven and on earth to contain him to a cross. When they nailed his feet and his hand on that cross, this were the feet that walked the land of Israel, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. It was the same feet that were walking on the Sea of Galilee. 
And when they nailed his hands to the cross, this was those hands that were calming the storm of the Sea of Galilee, that healed so many, even the most impossible diseases, and that were casting out every demon that went in the way of Jesus. These were the hands that blessed so many people. And there at the cross, it seems that those Roman nails brought the power of those hands to a standstill. Yet it was here at the cross on Calvary that the hands of Jesus carried out the greatest act ever. When Jesus hung there at the cross with his hands nailed to that tree, he was lifting up the whole sins of this world and brought for forgiveness to human mankind. When Jesus breathed his last, the Bible says it was on the eve of Passover. It was the very same time when here in Jerusalem, in the temple, the last Passover lambs would be slaughtered. The life of Jesus has come to a full circle. When Jesus started his ministry just 25 kilometers away from here at the shores of the river of Jordan, John the Baptist had to cry out over him, says, Behold the Lamb of God that would carry the sins of the world. And it was 700 years before Jesus was crucified here in Golgotha that the prophet Isaiah foresaw his suffering in the following way. Surely he has borne our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions and he was chastised for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. These hands of Jesus that were hanging on the cross 2,000 years ago, today they are open wide and they are welcoming you. He will not reject you. But the word of God says, as we come to him, he will welcome us in his family. Today, you can experience this salvation that Jesus purchased for the world 2,000 years ago with his own life. Today can be your day of salvation. Let me pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I do pray for everybody who is watching us today on this Good Friday program. I ask you that this will become the day of salvation for everybody who does not know you as his Savior. And Father, I do ask you that as they turn to you, as they say, Lord, we want you to be our master, I ask you that you allow them to experience the power of the forgiveness of the blood of Jesus. We thank you what you have done 2,000 years ago to save us, to redeem us, and to heal us. We pray this in the wonderful and mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. God bless you here from the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. Praising God today for our salvation. And the one and only that points us to the Father, Yeshua ben Elohim.
Sing of your name, Yeshua. Yeah, sure. 